I'd like to call to order the regular formal meeting of the Iowa City City Council for July the 2nd, 2019. Roll call, please. Cole. Here. Mims. Here. Salee. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. Drug Morton. Here. Uh, people who are watching uh, surely notice that Mazair Sully is not here again tonight. She's still in Sudan, has not been able to get a flight back from Sudan yet. So hopefully at some point she'll be able to make it back. Uh, um, but we don't really know. We've had fitful conversations with her, I mean fitful communications with her over a distance. But we certainly hope that she is well. All right, so greetings to everyone. Thanks for coming. It's been a pretty brutally hot and humid day, a good day to be discussing climate change, which we did in our work session just a few minutes ago. But now we need to move on to other things, so we'll turn to items two through seven, which is the consent calendar. Could I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar as presented or amended? So moved. Second. Moved by, was it you, Susan? Yeah. Moved by Mims, second by Cole. Uh, um, roll call, please. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmark? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item eight, community comment. This is for any item that's not on the formal meeting agenda. So if anyone would like to address any topic not on the formal meeting agenda, please feel free to come up and speak. I'd like to ask you to keep your comments brief. I've, I don't, it looks like not many people are here, so but not more than five minutes at the most, preferably less. Hello, please state your name. Uh, my name's Ann. Uh, I've reviewed full, full and full name and please. UN. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've reviewed agenda item 9B regarding rezoning at the northwest corner of Benton Street and Orchard Street, which has informed the and, and excuse me, if you're going to address an item that's on the agenda, this it is has not informed the time uh, general observations that I'd like to make a statement on. Is oh, that all right? But, but not about Sorry. that specific topic. No. Sure. Thank you. The condensing of residential areas can be beneficial to the mission of mitigating and slowing the progression of the current climate crisis, which is several, with several exceptions. More vigorous standards should be adopted regarding the energy efficiency of newly developed and existing structures in both multifamily residential buildings as well as single family homes. This is due to the typical energy loss of residential homes in the city, which increases overall greenhouse gas emissions in the area and therefore contributes to the current climate crisis. In addition, construction of more impermeable pavements should be considered regarding increased runoff it causes during the inevitable storms that will continue to increase in magnitude during the current climate crisis. Mitigation of impermeable surfaces is expected by the residents of Iowa City and if their construction is necessary, further permeable surfaces requirements should be made by both the Zoning Commission and City Council in order to mitigate flood risks. This these include larger green spaces, planting of native plants with deep root systems that encourage infiltration and reduce soil runoff, and the installation of water catchment systems. I encourage the council to consider the environment, environmental ramifications of all decisions made by this body, particularly in the context of the current climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, and thanks for taking the time to come up and share your views about that. Hi, Megan. faster for me to actually write than put this little sticker on. Hello, my name is Megan Alter and I live in the South District and uh, I have a brief PowerPoint that is to give you some feedback on a survey that I conducted not long after Lucky's announced its closing. Um, I did it very informally, not scientifically. It was done through SurveyMonkey and um, in social media, essentially. So um, I want to share with you an amalgamation of the results. Hopefully, there we go. Um, and this can just give you so, a sense of input of what the community uh, responded to. Unfortunately, this was not translated, so this is only English reading and writers. Um, so <coughs> take it for what it is, but I do think it gives a snapshot as to what the community is thinking. So. It was a very simple question. Uh, what should go in Lucky's space? 
What do you think would be the best use for Lucky Space for the South District and for Iowa City? There were slightly more than what I said, uh, what's listed here, 231 answered, um, although that's a close enough. So as a visual, and I will get the specifics, as a visual, this purple line here is actually a one-stop shop like Target. Um, others that were referenced as Decent choices were grocery store, um, an anchor store, as well as, I want to say, restaurants. So here is actually a little bit more easy way to see this. Um, groceries, 12%. Anchor store, close to 5%. Uh, indoor, affordable indoor recreation space, 3%. Uh, other, which I'll get to, was five, almost 6%. But as you can see, one-stop shopping like Target was 67%. So there was a pretty clear uh, selection here. So in a nutshell, several of the questions are condensed here. So who responded? What were the percentages? of um, the spread across the city, who lives in the South District versus who responded from outside of it, how useful would this service or business be, and how often would it be frequented? 231 people responded. 69% live in the South District, 154. 67 who responded lived in Iowa City. A lot were on the east side. 67% responded that the new service or business would be extremely useful. That was 146. And then 77% responded that they would frequent their selection at least once a week. Um, and I felt that that's an important thing to include because while somebody can say, yeah, that's my first choice, but I'm going to go there twice a you know, it's not going to matter. So this is something that they really did believe um, they would frequent. So that's kind of just the nutshell of the statistics. And I'm going to actually send this all to council, the PDF from which this all came, so you can peruse it at your leisure. Um, but other suggestions for improvements to the Iowa City marketplace and its retail neighborhood. And I've taken a selection that are representative. Um, someone says, let's bring in something that provides jobs and services that the neighborhood will use. Um, improve the parking lot. Make, pede make it pedestrian friendly to get there. That was a pretty significant cluster of comments about the difficulty of accessing it unless you were in a car and also the state of the parking lot itself. It really is this great big ocean that is difficult for pedestrians, bicyclists, and even people on bus line. Um, there aren't that many stops. And um, so that was something that came up again, or several times. Um, Someone said, rightfully so, I hate having to drive to Coralville for socks. With the closing of Paul's as well as Kmart, there really is no, nothing in that area. You ha do have to travel all the way down to Walmart or go out to Coralville to do that. And it would be very nice, a couple of comments noted that it would be very nice to have a, an alternative to Walmart. Um, someone suggested for betterment of the Iowa City marketplace in general, a sign easily seen from Highway 6 displaying the movies that are being shown, as well as the stores that are there. Um, and then I will note this last one, more pedestrian, bicycle, and bus friendly. Now that even the inside is chopped up, we never stroll around inside, and outside is too ugly and unfriendly to pedestrians to do that either. So provide a covered outdoor seating area and a throughway inside from one end to the other. And that, too, was something that came up that actually the flow of the mall itself is not very user friendly. You really are going there for a particular destination rather than sort of being able to visit multiple stores. It's difficult to access. So additional suggestions to wrap up are actually, um, these were more outliers, but I thought that they were interesting. Renovate Eastdale Plaza, it, uh, create affordable attractions for teens. Um, a couple of people suggested annexes for the public library and the senior center. Someone suggested something like a Home Depot. Yes, Ace Hardware is there, but something where you could get like two by four or you know drywall, things like that. That was before Harbor Freight moved in, so I'm not sure how that would affect anything. Um, in general, encourage the Iowa City Marketplace to modernize, renovate the theater, create a food court, attract an anchor store. So really bring it back to a traditional mall, if you will. Um, and then 
someone else made a suggestion, and I do concur with this, that help pedestrians who are trying to cross Highway 6. They suggested a walking bridge that might not be feasible, but something that actually helps pedestrians. It's a pretty busy outlet, and yet south of Sycamore is a big residential area, and so there are a number of people who actually are crossing the highway all the time. That's great. Thank, Thank you, Megan. You. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jan Ashman, and I'm here on behalf of the Johnson County Humane Society to try to figure out where we are on um, our feline trap, neuter, and return proposal that we, um, I think we gave it to you last year in, in July. Um, we're here to answer questions. Uh, Chris Whitmore is here, and so is Lori Kendrick, and she's right behind me, and she's got something to say. No. Thank you, Jan. Not really. I was just uh, <laughs> going to ask what your direct, the council's direction on that yeah, is. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, we did not have a chance to talk about it during the work session. As you know, we're going to do that. That'll be the first item when we get when we um, adjourn this formal meeting and go back into our work session. I think it'll be a very short formal meeting, so we should get to that pretty quickly. Hi, uh, my name is Aisha Kazembi, and I would like to make a comment on item 9A and how it relates to the current climate crisis and some possible equity issues. But you mean generally, not specifically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as mentioned in today's agenda item write-up, Iowa City currently has a separa separation distance between fuel pump dispensers and residential zones set at 100 feet. Um, the fire code only requires a 10-foot separation distance, but many cities choose to use a larger limit for the general welfare of residents. Iowa City does have a relatively higher separation distance, but this is a good thing because gas stations and pumps are known for emitting a variety of toxic fumes that are linked to health hazards such as cancer and asthma. Some of these substances include benzene as well as other emissions that are released from cars driving in and out of the station. Not only are there adverse health effects associated with consistent exposure to, to fumes common around gas stations, but this also brings up an equity issue. Many of the Iowa City residents who will be exposed to the health risks associated will be those who live in mixed-use areas. Residents who live in areas with this type of land use may be more likely to be more income. This means that there's already an equ equity issue concerning the accessibility of health care, which may only be exacerbated by exposure to toxic fumes. Finally, lowering the separation limit between residential zones and fuel dispensing equipment makes it easier to set locations for new gas stations and encourages the use of fuel. Considering our current climate crisis, as a city, I think we should be working towards discouraging the use of fuels that are contributing to climate change whenever possible. For the well-being of Iowa City residents and the environment, I think it's a good idea to keep the current separation distance at 100 feet. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Blair, you're up. Okay. Please state your name, Blair. My name is Blair Frank. I live at, uh, in Iowa City. <laughs> well, I'm not addressing, I'm not intending to address any of the specifics, but I am uh, fresh from hearing the work session. And so I have a few comments to make because I've been very concerned about climate action and climate emergency. And I've worked for a few years on food security, um, edible foods uh, grown in urban areas. Um, also uh, very interested in teaching children about uh, climate change, about growing uh, and harvesting food, biomass, which is not known for uh, being present in urban areas, but uh, bringing a lot of that with permaculture yards all over the place. Um, and just thinking of climate change, local food uh, creates jobs as well as nourishment. And you, you may remember me, I'm the senior that had Gaia's Peace Garden. And for nine years I had that project and we had 70 fruit trees and uh, medicinal herbs in the uh, under storage and uh, that area. When I found out that the cherry tree was listed for removal, it, it really frustrated me. It hurt me deeply because my wife and some of us were a part of uh, planting that place. 
I think the big thing that, that really hurt was that we weren't included on the discussion. Here's a steak, says food removal. So I go over and have a discussion at the uh, rec center. Well, how is a decision like that made? And somebody said, well, it is on our property. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm um, a citizen of Iowa City. What do you mean, our property? And um, that still is a, a, a comment that I'm trying to figure out. The second thing was that I said, well, was it the park and rec decision? And they said, no, it's an engineering decision. And I said, well, then who makes that uh, the engineering uh, decisions? Well, I've heard the comments that we've made about climate emergency, and I know my, my five minutes will be up in a hurry. But one of the things that I hear a lot about is that we're uh, about empowering or communicating an 85-page plan, which I affirm you for and, and happy for the, all the work in that 85-page plan. But is there, what is the plan, and maybe that's coming next, that um, communicates that to everybody? When I went to the farmer's market one morning, I, I had four questions, and I asked people, how many of, one of the first questions was, uh, how many of you know that we have an 85-page Iowa City Climate Action Plan? And I asked a lot of the vendors, it's not a scientific study, but most of them didn't know that we had an 85-page plan. And then some of them had not read it, and of course. One of my two suggestions, and then I'll sit down, is that in a lot of different cities, and I've traveled to, to Scotland a number of times, Ireland, I just got back from the rainforest in Vancouver. One of the things that I hear over and over again is that people in other countries are saying, people in the United States are counting carbon, and they're uh, trying to figure out percentage-wise, and, and I'm affirming the graphs and everything, but there's gotta be another, uh, another uh, aspect of that of addressing climate change other than the technical, and that is the communication. In Ann Arbor, in Austin, in Portland, and other places, they have a thing called conscious cafes. And I wrote this in a letter to the city council and said it a couple of weeks ago. But one of my suggestions is that we talk um, more uh, on a horizontal level about this 85-page plan. So one of my suggestions is to implement uh, regular discussions, places where people meet uh, um, regularly, at coffee shops maybe, and have the subject be the 85-page climate action plan, perhaps. Um, I didn't suggest that we hire somebody else. Um, I'm saying we empower the people that live here because I think there's a lot of gifts and talents that are not being tapped into. I know a number of people that, it, that studied this and went to Scotland, and I've been told by a, a very gifted person in this community that this is one of the Bibles for climate action. And um, it's great, it's great. I love it, and it's good to know. But we also need to, to allow the children to be a part of this whole process by protecting things, and I'm, I know I'm getting a little, I'm just so hurt. I, I just really felt so uh, left out when we decided to cut down a cherry tree. These are the cherries, that's my prop. Thanks for listening to me. I affirm you all for what you're doing. I affirm all of these people for what they're doing because the day that we really do good is when we empower each other, and that's coming. Thank sure. you, Blair. Thanks for coming down tonight. Anyone else? Hello. Good evening. Martha Norbeck. It's complicated. I think my address is on record. <laughs> so I wanted to speak to a letter I wrote to council, which ties into your conversation earlier this evening at the, at the work session. Um, you know, we have the technology to get to that 2030 goal of 45% reduction. Brenda laid it out pretty clearly. And then the takeaway I had was her, her, her final thing was we need to strengthen partnerships. And the city's really not empowered to do that directly. It needs to happen through relationships. Um, and so the letter I wrote to the council was suggesting that a person be um, assigned the responsibility of being kind of the hub of those partnerships. And the closing of that letter said, I'm not sure that this is a city staff position. Could the city be funding it? 
probably that's logical because then there's a stake and a natural link in communication with the city. But, you know, I'm thinking, Susan, one of the things you said was, you know, you need to make it easy. And then Pauline said, you've got to educate people. Well, this is about people actually giving a hoot, right? The reason people, you know, Ashley's saying, well, people aren't telling us they care about climate. Well, yeah, we're not telling you that, but we care. We're just not coming and telling you. So there's, there's this level of community engagement, which if we were running a political campaign, if climate change were running for president, we'd be canvassing door to door. I mean, this is political action at its best. If you want to pass a bond issue, you're not just going to hope people show up and say, please tax us more. It's just no. You need to, the city goes out and has a calculated campaign for going out and generating some belief in the community that you should pa pass said bond issue. Um, this is the bond issue uh, magnified dramatically because you don't just want people to agree to whatever incentives or taxes or whatever fee structure you get to do things. We also need people to change what they're doing. And it's not just the easy stuff. It's going to have to become the hard stuff. And, and let's face it, people do hard stuff all the time. People choose to do ridiculously hard things all the time in their lives. Why do they do that? Because they believe in something. And right now, we're not fostering a belief in the importance of acting on climate change. And I am not sure that a full-time city staff person is the right person to basically do a political action campaign. Do I think the city should be funding that and supporting that and having a direct tie with staff? Yes. But one of the things that happened when I was on council in Fairfield was we actually hired a sustainability coordinator that was funded from multiple sources. And so he was actually able to play those funding sources off of each other and leverage that in his work with the community because he was like saying, I'm not just speaking for the city of Fairfield. I'm also speaking for ISU Extension Service. I'm also speaking for this company that kicked in a few thousand dollars. And so suddenly he was empowered to speak on a broader scale. And so I'm asking you to think about this problem differently. Don't approach it like, oh, we just need to allocate money to hire another person. We need to change the way we think about moving forward. Because if we keep doing what we've been doing just a little bit better, let's face it, we're not going to get there. You know, we need, to, we need to be creative. And I think it's time to think about what that creative outlook would be. So thank you. Thank you, Martha. Would anybody else like to address us? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else, so we'll move on to item 9, planning and zoning matters. Item 9A, zoning code text amendment related to separation distance requirement for fuel dispensing equipment. This is an ordinance amending Title 14 zoning code to modify the provisional and special exception approval criteria regarding the distance separation between fuel dispensing equipment and residential zones for quick vehicle services, services, uses. I'm going to open the public hearing. Hi, Danielle. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Danielle Sitzman, Neighborhood and Development Services. Uh, the first agenda item for you tonight is the zoning code text change uh, addressing the separation distances of uh, uh, quick service vehicle station uh, fuel dispensing devices. Uh, this was uh, brought to our attention recently when uh, a, the owner of a come and go uh, proposed to invest in a redevelopment of that site to continue it as a gas station with a different uh, orientation of their pumps to facilitate a better site design. Um, and in reviewing their application, uh, the determination was made that they would have difficulty making any renovation uh, to meet our current code for the separation distances. 
Um, such a proposal would require either a provisional administrative approval or a special exception approval process through the Board of Adjustment using a very similar criteria, and that separation dis distance was identified as something that would be uh, a, 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 a difficulty to facilitate that. Many of you are probably familiar with this gas station. It's one of the few places you can purchase uh, fuel for your vehicle as well as uh, have a convenience store option for uh, other sundries that you might need. It's located in a neighborhood off of Marmot Trek. The proposal is essentially to rotate the gas pumps. There's three pumps on site. Rotate them 90 degrees so they're oriented uh, perpendicular to Mormon Trek rather than parallel. Um, some additional views of the site showing the um, surrounding neighborhood. Um, the current requirement uh, does require at least a 100-foot separation um, in this particular uh, situation. There are other situations in other zoning districts where that can be reduced down to 70 feet from a residential boundary. Um, staff is proposing that distance be amended for e either case down to 50 feet rather than the 100-foot separation. Um, in and there's some also some things that will not be changing. Um, there's some uh, provisions in the code that allow for kind of special consideration of, of proposals when they can't meet that um, separation distance at all. Um, but we're not proposing to make amendments to that. So in considering this change, staff went through the usual process of trying to figure out why we have a, a rule in the first place. Um, we were unable to identify the origin of this particular um, distance. Um, it's similar in nature to another separation distance that applies to above ground storage tanks, large storage tanks for fuel. However, uh, uh, gasoline is pumped from underground storage tanks through dispensing equipment is necessarily different than that kind of arrangement. So we were unable to locate the exact um, origin of that separation in our code. So then we looked out beyond ourselves to see what nationally is done and what our peer cities in Iowa uh, do to regulate um, these uh, uses. Um, we discovered in our peer cities a wide range of distances and um, not a whole lot of uh, reasoning behind them, but we can find us what's on the books and so the actual distances that are measured in between um, pumping um, and, and, and residential zones. So there's a wide range, um, anything down to um, 10 feet, which, is, which corresponds to the uh, International Fire Code standard, and up to 50 feet uh, in the West Des Moines area. And then a range of things in the 20 to 15, 25 foot separation. Um, we did consult with our fire departments as we were aware of what the International Fire Code said as, as far as the minimum requirement. Um, that, Like I said, that is 10 feet uh, separation distance between field dispensing equipment and a residential boundary zone. Um, they concurred that um, the proposed uh, reduction in distance would not be in conflict with that, and therefore they uh, had no... Uh, opposition to the proposed changes. We'd also look at other, uh, all the existing gas stations, or many of the existing gas stations in town to kind of get a read on um, whether they were complying with the current ordinances or how many situations maybe were, that might be non-conforming with that one, the existing 100-foot separation. Um, in general, most stations are, are located well away from the pumping uh, dispense, the fuel dispensing is located well away from residential zones. We think that's actually an element of the marketability of a fueling station wanting to have uh, prominent visibility and picking sites that are larger anyway. Um, we did, um, excuse me, so the way our code is set up is based on, the approval process is based on um, which zone you're in and then what process you go through is either ask for that special exception with the Board of Adjustment or a PR, meaning provisional. So there's a wide range of commercial districts that could allow quick vehicle surfacing uses and just fuel dispensing equipment and a different approval process depending on the intensity of the commercial district itself. We did look at the uh, properties zoned appropriately now to be allowed to have quick vehicle servicing and where those properties are in relationship to residential properties. Um, this map does show those parcels throughout the city. The majority of potential future parcels are clustered near South Gilbert Street, Highway 6, or Dodge Street, and there are a few potential parcels situated in uh, areas that would potentially be neighborhood commercial. However, like I said, the market demand for filling stations tends to not focus in neighborhoods. We don't see that the, this code change would create a large demand for additional neighborhood gas stations. They're kind of more of an ameni amenity that many neighborhoods um, are going without at this point, and having to travel farther away to fuel vehicles or to, like, 
like I say, be able to purchase um, some limited groceries. This is the same map just showing those parcels highlighted in different colors depending on the approval process, whether it's special exception or provisional. So in summary, the uh, current requirement places a constraint on gas stations which might want to um, service denser areas of the city or stations that are located already in close proximity to residential that want to make, might want to make re um, redevelopment or reinvestment in their property and, and, and in this case in particular, particular result in an improved site design. Uh, many cities both nationally and in Iowa, and in Iowa have a separation distance uh, lower than uh, our current and more in line with our proposed 50 foot separation and we would continue to be um, consistent across all of our residential, or, sorry, commercial and residential zones. So the next steps for this would be um, consideration by City Council tonight. Um, based on staff's review of the national and local peer cities in consultation with the Iowa City Fire Department and based on the analysis of the potential impacts uh, to sites throughout the city, staff did recommend the proposed code change and at May, their May 6th meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission voted to recommend approval of it to you tonight. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Danielle? I, I would like to hear a little bit more detail about the safety aspect to this because presumably the reason why these distances <laughs> exist in the first place, we have a flammable liquid and we also have fumes from that. Um, do we have any particular details about how much, the, one, the fumes would, would waft out into the neighborhoods? And secondly, are there any issues related to the fire hazard or anything like that? So not contained in the zoning code. When we look to our zoning code, uh, normally we would look for it to give us clues to what negative externalities might be regulated by an, addi an additional separation between things. There is no mention in our zoning code of that, nor in any of our kind of peer cities in their analysis there. Therefore, we'd look to the fire code, and that's a code that's developed in um, response to public health uh, concerns, identifiable um, hazards that have been addressed with the firefighting community and the fire marshals. Their separation distance is much less than what we're proposing, so the 10-foot separation is what the fire code would deem is safe. I have to imagine, I'm not an expert in this, but I have to imagine the technology over time. Um, these are systems that are tested and required to meet standards on their own outside of the zoning code. So so it's like buying a, an appliance that you would plug in. So they have other uh, safety measures that they have to meet. So we'd look to the fire code as the, the authority in this case for safety. I, I think, um, and this issue came up on Forest View, and I, I remember meeting with staff on it, uh, not specifically on this distance, although that was a concern of mine because the gas station at that time was part of the project. and. and proximity to the residential areas, which kind of led me to what we heard during the community comment period was that the, the issue could very well be uh, the vapors and the impacts from a public health standpoint uh, on adjacent land uses. And so my, one of my questions would be, um, and it kind of reminds me of this question on, uh, you know, building code, energy efficiency requirements, is, is there anything at the state level, uh, say DNR, that might regulate air quality standards? I don't know that I can answer that. I know the DNR is involved in the underground storage of fuels quite intensively, so underground storage tanks is regulated by DNR, and they, of course, have their standards for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I can speak to the additional health concerns or safety elements. The proposed separation would meet um, the fire code, which is also adopted by the state. Uh -huh. Could, could, I mean, I, is this, is this going to be just a one reading or what is this? Uh, three readings. This is three a, readings. This is three could, readings. You, could you look into that? Um, Sure, absolutely. First of all, first first that, and then what I also noticed when we were talking about Forest View, it, it, it brought to my attention the fact that, uh, you know, the vapors escape at certain points in the process. So, you know, when the, when the gas, when the fuel tanks are being filled, that's one piece of when vapors can escape. Also, when you fill up your tank, um, you know, when I travel out of state, the the pumps have a, a, a better control over the, the vapors escaping from, um, you know, from that when you're filling up. 
So one of my questions there is is where we do find the distances to be you know min less than 100 feet if um, we we could establish a requirement to ensure that the that that particular gas station <coughs> excuse me gas station has better control over um, the degree to which the vapors could escape into the air. We can certainly look into that, but I think it's a highly regulated industry by others, so I'm not sure if we're going to find that we have the authority right. to regulate. Well, that's, that's why I, I think this, this whole state question seems to me to be important to understand, because it does seem to me that well, yeah, when I leave the state is when I start seeing these um, more regulated control. I would think, since we're talking about vapors, that that's a matter of air pollution and it's controlled and regulated by this, I guess, the state DNR. I'm not sure who. Well, that's what I was just saying. Uh, with regard to air pollution control. So I don't know, maybe you could check into that for check. us. So, I didn't see the photo of the proposed plan of come and go. You, you'd mentioned that they're going to move the pumps. They're cur they currently run north south along uh, Mormon Track. <laughs> So they're planning to move them more in an east-west direction? They're and then only in kind of concept development at this point, but yes, they would rotate them 90 degrees so that they would run east-west and be a more on the north side of the site. On the north side, not the south side, because currently the housing development is on the okay. south side of the building, so it would be further away possibly they're, from... The, yeah, their concept is to move their building farther south and their pumps farther north. Further north. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? How many, would they add any additional pumps, or is it just changing the orientation? They would not be adding pumps. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Hi there. Good evening. My name is Keith Wagen. I am with CDA. Also with me tonight, Siobhan Harmon and Brittany Andreessen with Come and Go. Um, just wanted to supplement uh, the previous presentation and make a few mention of some notes and just some additional information. Um, concerning vapors and, and uh, venting, there are lots of federal mandates and provisions in place uh, to handle venting. Um, in many different capacities. For example, when pumps are being operated, venting happens up through the canopy. It's not happening at the ground level. And additionally, when um, the underground fuel tanks are filled by the fuel provider, they are capturing vapor and fumes and basically taking those with them. So they're not only just filling the fuel up on site, but they are also um, protecting those uh, the vapors and fumes from just bleeding out in the atmosphere. And that actually goes back into tanks within their trucks. So. Um, a couple other things just to mention, we do have some concepts with us of what the proposed layout would be uh, for the site. So as was mentioned, essentially where the canopy and the pump islands sit today, we would rotate that 90 degrees and it'd move north just a little bit. What we're really excited about with this site and the, the proposed concept is the improved access and circulation through the site. So a couple of things we worked very hard with staff, um, trying to find a, a concept plan that, that benefited both Come and Go and the city of Iowa City to improve efficiencies and access to the site. One of the things that we talked about during those conversations was uh, limiting the number of pump islands on site. Typically, when we come into a new site, we'd be looking at, at six <coughs> pump islands. In this case, we agreed to uh, stick with three, which is what's out there today. So with those, with the canopy being rotated and moved slightly north, it actually, in a sense, pulls that, that fuel canopy further away from the majority of the nearest residential units. An interesting fact about this site, um, this is a unique situation. The site's actually rather small compared to the sites we usually see. This site is 158 feet wide and has residential across the street to the west and south. So there is not a dot on the site with the current 100 foot separation requirement where this site would be could be redeveloped based on the current requirements and provisions. So. Um, we're happy with the concessions and the agreements that we've had with staff and are excited to move this project forward and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks, Keith. Thank Does you. anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? <coughs> oh. 
Okay, seeing no one else, before I close the public hearing, I need to ask you whether you are inclined to vote in accordance with the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation to approve. Yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I have some sure. concerns. Yeah. Okay, but I'm seeing a majority that is, so given that, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I have a motion for first consideration, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Well, as I, as I said during the question period, I, I do have concerns about this, uh, this project in terms of its, uh, the air quality standards. Uh, you know, benzene is a known toxic material that is released in these, in the vapors. You know, I'll, I'll support it kind of conditionally now, but I am very interested in hearing what kinds of regulatory controls we have at the state level, and and um, you know, we'll reevaluate it at the second reading. Okay. And Does this have to be citywide? I mean, would we be able to zone this particular parcel? I know in some particular cases we've we've done that. Is um, does it have to be citywide? <laughs> Well, we're not really rezoning, we're changing a, a code requirement. So yeah. you would have to, if you were going to apply it to this site only, you would have to identify what's different about this site that means it okay. should apply it here and not other places. Okay. Is, is this site currently under the 100 feet already? In, in the reorientation, it would be. No, but the current orientation. Yeah. Well, the current orientation is under 100. Yes. Right. Yeah. There's, there's no way to, to rectify that. Either have to stay with what they have as a non-conforming use, or they have to close and relocate. And the, spec, the special exception process now is off the table for them. Is, is that correct? So they would have to get a special exception, but they couldn't meet the criteria, which is the 100-foot separation. OK. So they couldn't vary from that requirement. And with the current distance, how is it in comparison? You know, I haven't measured, uh, and Keith might know that, uh, what the distance is currently, but it sounds like there's no place on the site that could be 100 feet. I, I'm assuming our uh, proposal right. of 50 feet gets them to, to be in compliance, so it's somewhere between 50 and 100 or more, so. Do we know? No. Keith Wigan with CDA. I don't know the exact number, but if you imagine the, the canopy as it sits today north south, we're just we're literally just taking that and rotating it. Generally, it's about in the same spot, but a little bit further north. Okay. We're moving at feet, um, maybe less than 10 feet or so. Okay. And that's simply just the whole reason for moving it is just to improve access um, along the street. Okay. Thank you. I did have some concerns when we initially heard this proposal, and that's why um, thank you for the information regarding the fire code, because I, I had requested that. So that was good to know. Uh, and I also had concerns because of the nearby residents, and, and that housing development there to the south uh, does have a lot, a number of disabled folks and um, young fam families with young children. So I was concerned about that. But to hear that it's actually moving further away from that residence area, and we're not looking at a new gas station; it already exists there. So if you're concerned about fumes, there was already fumes; it was already there. Uh, and I'm actually excited about it because I drive that road all the time, and that intersection, it, 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 it's awkward. The drives, the two. Drives Drives are terribly awkward, especially with our reconstruction of Mormon Trek. So I'm very excited to see how you're going to reconstruct that, and, and I think it's going to be a big improvement for that. I guess for me, with the reorientation, is not that big of a deal. Well, it's not that big of a difference. Um, I'm assuming with the distance, I would ask or echo Rockney's comment about how is it really viable for us to like just earmark this project and get something approved just for this project. 
Yeah, because, I mean, to that end, I mean, we're not just doing this particular parcel. It's my understanding this would be a city as a whole. And I do have concerns about facilitating expansion of gas stations in other parts of the community. Um, this looks like a very good project, this particular one. It doesn't look like that big a deal. Um, but this, as I understand it, is for the city as a whole. Um, so I have some concerns about it. So certainly with the Forest View, the gas station by far was one of the key factors for a lot of those residents, and I think rightfully so. And we ended up removing the gas station in that context. So that's sort of where I am, at least at this point. Yeah, the, the key thing is that, as Eleanor said, this, we're not doing a rezoning here. Sure. We're doing a text amendment to the zoning code. Mm -hmm. But it, but again, it would be for the code, which it can be in another community or another placement or yeah. parcel where it will be yeah. 50. And so there is no other options for this develop, for this transaction to take place. They don't meet the current 100-foot requirements, so there's going to have to be a code change of some kind if it's if it can be narrowed um, to apply to a particular circumstance, perhaps focusing on the there's no increase in the nonconformity, for instance, that might be a possibility. Uh, owner, is there a way that we could give where we could keep the same standard and then we would give the board of adjustment if certain criteria were met? to go to a lower distance, so we would give the Board of Adjustment the authority? Is, is that possible? I think possible? that's essentially what we're talking about doing, changing the... Within email. the Board of Adjustment, or is it... So the Board of Adjustment does have that ability, but only in certain overlay districts. So the Towncrest Design Guidelines District, they can choose to reduce the separation distance, the riverfront crossings, and the east side mixed-use district. So there's already an exception where the Board could make that kind of reduction. We're not proposing that in this code change. What we're proposing is to allow citywide for the separation so distance to be reduced to 50 feet. So to clarify, you would not go to the Board of Adjustment, you would go as of right. You you, do well, it. it depends on whether it's provisionally approved, which yeah. would be a staff approval, or whether it's in a district that requires the Board of Adjustment to make the, right. the to review it. Either way, the criteria are the same. The separation distance applies. Um, and then only in those other existing districts could, if you're headed to the Board of Adjustment, mm -hmm. could you also ask for a reduction from whatever the standard is for the circumstances of being in one of those overlay districts. I think it's just, a, I mean, staff can look at it, the issue of, uh, I don't know the details right now, but. Sure. I, I think we can look at it. What I would look at no, is what, it's, what is it next to, and is there a way to narrow the circumstances to this site based on this, this context of this site now? So it may be yeah. more yeah, adjacent I mean, zones. Yeah. It, another, another approach might be the size of the gas station. You know, if it's a small gas station, then there, you know, the, the distance could be 50 feet. I, I or the fact that it's an already existing gas station and you're not going to change the, yeah. the sure. facts on the ground, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think we're parsing this much too precisely. The, the, the gas station has been there for a long time. It's been emitting fumes, whatever fumes it has, uh, for a long time. The fumes are per almost certainly not worrisome. Beyond that, nobody knows why the current code distance was created. And I think you said, Danielle, that most of the communities you looked at had, they had was this shorter separation distances than the 100 feet? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you can see our... Yeah, so we're really parsing this way too much, I think. That's my own personal view. Any further discussion? Hearing um, none. So. I think just for me, I, I would like to know the health concerns. I mean, first time dealing with this, I want to make sure that I do my due diligence. Mm -hmm. We're going to be, you know, amending whatever we're amending, <laughs> um, where it would be city, you know, essentially people can do less than 100. So um, I think I think I hear four votes <laughs> that get this to the next um, level. Um, I'm not going to support this tonight. I'm hoping to get more information. Never mind. 
Well, I was saying you were a yes. 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 Yeah, I yes. know. Sorry. Yeah. Did speak. I don't want to have some mess up here. But okay. I, I just want. Are, are we looking at four votes to move it forward? Or I'm yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Because if we don't want, I mean, if, if there's I've something we can change. I've already closed the public hearing. Right. No, I, I know, yeah. but that's a. But we'd rather not go back to P and Z if we're going to make some change. Right. Yeah. So, any further discussion? All right, hearing none, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? No. Thomas? Yes. Frog Martin? Yes. Cole? No. Motion carries uh, four to two. Moving on, item 9B, rezoning at the northwest corner of Benton Street and Orchard Street. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 1.75 acres of land located at the northwest corner of Benton Street and Orchard Street from medium density single family residential RS8 to riverfront crossings orchard RFC O. Is this second consideration? Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Teague. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Uh, Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Frog Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 9C, rezoning at the southwest corner of East First Street and South Gilbert Street. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoning 0 0.20 acres of land located at the southwest corner of East First Street and South Gilbert Street from intensive commercial CI1 to riverfront crossings South Gilbert RFC. SG. This is second consideration, but the applicant has requested expedited action. And correspondence about that is included in the late handouts from yesterday. I move that the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? I see no reason not to do this. Agreed. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Move final adoption at this time. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mims, second by Teague. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 9D, capital subdivision preliminary and final plat. This is a resolution approving the preliminary and final plats of Capital Subdivision, Iowa City, Iowa. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, second by Teague. Danielle, are you going to say a few things about this? I'll say a few things about this. This is an application for a prelim and final plat for the property at the northwest corner of uh, Moss Ridge Road and North Dubuque Street, just north of I-80. Um, this follows a rezoning that was done not too long ago that had conditions on it. Primarily, those conditions are to be fulfilled with building permitting and site plan review. So it's too early to say that they've been fulfilled, but they are on track to do that as they go through this development process. Um, one of the conditions did require general conformance with a concept plan showing the building to be uh, primarily oriented to the corner as this is a uh, corner site. Um, the site would be accessed off Moss Ridge Road and there's some public improvements that will be made including closing and access, installing sidewalks um, to the site. It's also in a floodplain and has previously been approved to uh, be filled to remove it from the floodplain prior to development. Um, showing its trajectory through the development process here, you are at the preliminary and actually final plat stage. Um, staff has uh, reviewed it for compliance with uh, previous conditions, the comprehensive plan and the applicable subdivision standards. Staff does recommend approval of the proposed plats. Um, the Planning Commission took this up at their May 16th meeting and also forwarded it to you tonight with a recommendation of approval. Happy to answer questions. 
any questions? I don't hear any. Excuse me. I don't hear any questions. So thank you, Danielle. Anybody else want to address this topic? Okay. Council discussion. Oh, sorry, Martha. Go ahead. I think this is a great opportunity to point out that climate should be part of this discussion. Um, they want to build in a floodplain. I mean, even if you raise it, I'm working on a project in Des Moines where they literally are saying, well, we don't need to put the building higher because we've got a levee. And I keep saying, don't count on it, you know, over and over and over. So they finally agreed to put all the equipment up high. But I guess you have a burden when you're making this choice to say, yeah, you can build in this place that's in a floodplain, because you'll build it up and you'll do the right thing. But I have to bring this up at this Des Moines uh, Animal Shelter Project every meeting, every meeting, because they came to drift away and forget that they're in the floodplain because they're projected by the levee, and oh, we can adjust on that. because and And the reason that I am at the table is because I'm the lead consultant. And I bring up a climate at every meeting and remind them every single time where they are living. And so I ask the question, if you're going to approve this, what kind of, you don't have any control once you say okay. Um, and I don't know how you resolve that. Obviously, it's been through the process, and I realize I'm coming in at the 11th hour, and there's a process, and you'll probably say okay. But I think this is a great example of how this should be integrated into every conversation and infused throughout the city. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one else, council discussion? I'll just kind of leap off the cliff here. Uh, it, uh, Martha raises a really important point, and it, th it seems to me when we did the rezoning, Rockney, you were the only person in the negative. Uh, it was, is yeah. That you yeah, it was to? at least one of the votes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I'm going to support this because I also support the rezoning, but Martha does raise an important point, but it, it raises a larger question, which is not really about the flooding of the gas station, but about the gas station. So if we're truly serious about climate action and reducing carbon emissions uh, on, at the rate we are proposing to do that, we need to be imagining that at some point in the not-so-distant future, there won't be any new gas stations, or there will be few and far between. So. We probably need to wrap our heads around that and start understanding what that implies and how to get there. I don't think it's fair to get there right here, right now with this particular proposal. Yeah, but I agree. We, we need to be looking ahead. I, I agree. It seems we do need a, you know, climate needs to be embedded in our review process in a more substantive way kind of in the way we have the equity toolkit it seems to me something along those lines where you know what are what are the impacts we we assess a project based on its climate impacts any further discussion Hearing none. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Frog Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 10, City Hall Boiler and BAS improvements. I'm looking forward to learning what BAS improvements are. This is a resolution approving plans, specifications, form of contract, an estimate for, of cost for the construction of the City Hall Boiler and BAS Improvements Project, establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing City Clerk to post notice to bidders, and fi fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'll open the public hearing. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie Seidel Johnson, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, this falls under our department as we have government buildings under our department. Um, BAS, Building Automation System. <laughs> it's the, uh, the control system that we're trying to move all city facilities to, allows for more efficient operations and efficient control and uh, 
monitoring of the, the heating and cooling systems. So I should say how amazing we're talking about replacing two boilers on one of the hottest days of the year. Um, but last winter, in the middle of winter, we were limping through on just one <coughs> boiler working at that time. So this is a behind the scenes project um, that will get our building adequately heated with the backup system ready to go so that we can ensure um, heating and cooling throughout the year. And with everybody talking about climate action, yes. the the uh, automation system will help with that and making yeah. things more efficient. The boilers themselves provide about a 12% uh, more efficiency than the old system. I mean, the biggest limitation here is the age of this building and the construction of the building, um, but the automation system as well, it, it allows for smaller changes and, and so things don't get too far out of line at any one time. So. Thanks. Any other questions for Julie? Sounds important. Thanks. Unless you want to wear your fur coat. Yeah. Anyone, well, anyone else want to address this point. topic? Hey, look who it is. <laughs> I know, shocking. This happens to be my area of expertise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you should go out for a beer afterwards mm. or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm very pleased to see a high efficiency boiler being specified. Uh, the building automation systems will definitely, unquestionably uh, improve uh, operations. Um, and in fact, I think you guys totally undersold that in the memo because I think you would, because the 12% doesn't seem that impressive, but if you were to add in the additional potential for efficiency through the building automation system, um, I think you would see some, some good results. Um, so that you should definitely applaud. And, and also the fact that you have a BAS that is aligned with all the city buildings. So when you have that, you have power because you can't manage what you don't measure. So if you have the measurement tools and if you have the management tools, then you can actually finally adjust. It's like, you know, using a, a hammer to, to type with versus your fingertips. And so the BAS system is very valuable for being more uh, nuanced in how you operate all city facilities. So this is really good. Um, the one thing that comes up to me as it, because of what you said earlier, Jim, to point out this gas portion that is coming from Mid-American. And you're talking about replacing a gas boiler with a gas boiler. And the lifespan on a boiler like this is probably 20 years at least. Um, so the question is, um, is the city going to be a leader in electrification? Are you going to start looking seriously at converting your buildings to all electric? Um, and I think that needs to be a real discussion. And I do agree with the age of this building that this, it might be a non-starter. I know for public works, we had this conversation and there were literally, it would have added a million dollars to the project to make it an all electric building. And that just wasn't in the cards. And so you're gonna have to make some tough decisions about electrification. But I think if you take the leadership on electrification, then you are setting an example for other people to make those tough decisions. And some parts for electrification are easy, like doing a heat pump water heater in your home instead of replacing gas with gas. You can actually reduce emissions and save operating costs over 10 years. So there will be different decisions, and you're not going to make the same decision every time. But I think the discussion of electrification needs to be an integral part of evaluating every city facility so that you can be a leader in that conversion. How much more efficient is the electric than the gas? Yeah. <laughs> well, unless you did that analysis, did you do that analysis as your Mid-American review, Ron? No. You weren't involved in the Mid-American review. So when you do the review with Mid-American, you can evaluate that, and I have no idea. Okay. So I'm not throwing them under the bus here. I, they may have evaluated that. My guess would be for my supposition based on previous experience is that your um, total energy costs going to electric would increase and they would have ruled that out because your your monthly utility costs would have increased so much because per B2U of heat that you get out of electric unless you go to a, a heat pump thing that's a refrigerant based system an electric 
solution tends to be more expensive to operate. The only way to make electric heat more cost effective than gas is to go with refrigerant, which has its own problems, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Martha. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Cole, second by Teague. Discussion? This was a resolution. Do we already have a motion on the floor? Pardon me? There wasn't a public hearing with this, was there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah we just did one. Pardon? Oh, there was? Yes, there was. Yeah. Any discussion? Well, I think we just saw how complicated, how much, <laughs> once you introduce you know, the whole question of energy efficiencies and our sources of energy, things get more complicated, but I'm, I'm glad we had that brief conversation. I was almost afraid to ask if it was replacing gas with gas. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Motion carries six to zero. Item 11, council appointments. We have two commissions to appoint people to. The first is the telecommunications commission. We have one applicant for a full three-year term. No gender balance requirement. The applicant is Andrew Austin. Uh, I'd recommend we appoint Andrew Austin. What do you all think? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to I me. I have no problem yeah. with that. All right. Uh, and then the other is the airport commission. We have... Two applicants. two applicants for a four-year term. Again, no gender balance requirement. The two applicants are Claire Scott and Minetta Gardinier. Gardinier. So uh, I recommend we appoint Claire Scott. What do you think? I agree. Sounds good to me. Okay. Could I have a motion to appoint uh, Claire. And, uh, Claire Scott to the airport commission and... And and Austin uh, Andrew Austin to the Telecommunications Commission. It's Scott Scott Claire. Claire. Scott, Scott Claire. Could I do that? Yeah, Scott Claire. Sorry, I apologize to Scott Claire. Let me correct that on my own notes. Scott Claire. Not sure how I back I got that backwards. Mm -hmm. I think just to be clear, we talked about this before, is giving yep. other people an opportunity. I think Minette has been a great member of that commission, but giving new people an opportunity. Right. Yes, and thank her for that. Uh, for her so, good. Did, did, where are we? Did, I, did we get a motion? Motions. Yeah. Seconded? No, no one seconded no. that. Right. No. Second. <laughs> so who, who, made, who made the motion? I think I made the motion, didn't I? Rockney. Moved by Cole. Cole seconded by Teague. 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 Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, item 12, announcement of vacancies new. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission for the Woodlawn District. District, excuse me. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So that's and applications for that must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, August the 13th of this year. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Teague. Second by Cole. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Item 13, announcement of vacancies previous. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment to the Housing and Community Development Commission. Applications for that position must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, July the 9th of this year. We have one vacancy to fill a five-year term on the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment and one vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Historic Preservation Commission for the East College Street District. Vacancies will re for those positions will remain open until filled. All right, moving on to city council information. Could we start with Rockney and move to his left? 
Sure. Um, Pauline and I had our first meeting reference the mobile home task force with um, led by Sarah Barron as well as other representatives from North Liberty, City of Coralville, Johnson County, as well as state legislators at Walls. And we got off to a really strong start. Um, Sarah did a really terrific job, as everyone knows. Um, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, we're all sort of evaluating, you know, what authority we do and don't have and ways that we can constructively work together. Um, I think tentatively we're going to be meeting a second time here in late July. A little bit difficult to figure out the schedule with all of our, um, you know, schedules in July tend to be a little booked, but very productive meeting and I think it's um, not doing anything. I, I, don't, I don't think it is an option. And uh, so we're trying to find constructive solutions. And um, just as a little footnote to that, I, I think it's another example of, you know, a lot of times when you talk to the public, people say, well, why don't you work more with City of Coralville, City of North Liberty? Well, I'm really pleased that we're doing more and more of this, whether it's Susan's work with the Access Center, the way that you've cooperated there. Of course, we do our MPJOC and our joint meetings, but I think it's another example that it is a regional issue that we're dealing with. A lot of these parks are outside of the city limits of the city of Iowa City. Um, so I think it is does require a, a regional solution. And it's also, of course, nice to have a state legislator um, on the committee um, to sort of hopefully be able to generate some proposals that can make the way to Des Moines. And it does appear that there may be a few proposals that have a chance um, mm -hmm. next year, which, which was good to hear. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that. Okay, moving to your left, so that brings us to Bruce. Um, I have no committees to report on. Uh, uh, yeah, this isn't about committees. This is oh, just this general, is about general stuff. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, so on the 19th of June, I was at the University of Iowa Public Health, and I had the opportunity to speak to um, 10 undergraduate students that were visiting, um, and they'll be here for a little bit. And so that was um, awesome being on the panel there. Um, the mayor and I were at... Um, I, um, in Corville at the library as well as in Iowa City on, t on Thursday the 20th, and this was uh, talking about opportunity zones in both uh, Corville and Iowa City, and so if people are out there wanting to know more about that, ICAD um, is a point of contact, as well as Wendy Ford here at the City of Iowa City can help navigate that for you. And then on Saturday the 22nd, um, I was a part of of the Juneteenth event and was uh, privileged to give the proclamation. This event was very, very well attended. Um, it was very exciting, um, loved every minute of it. And later that day, I got to come downtown and uh, experience the block party, Iowa City downtown block party, which was very, very festive. Lots of, um, I think the way that the, um, it was, laid out this time was even better than last year and the crowd seemed to really flow nicely and get along so um, yeah it's been great being out in the community uh, just an addendum to Rockney's comments on the um, Affordable Housing Coalition Mobile Home Task Force. Uh, as he mentioned, there were several players involved, and I think uh, the intent was collaboration amongst uh, council members uh, fr from us, Iowa City, North Liberty, and Coralville, uh, as well as the Board, board of Supervisors uh, had representative Center for Worker Justice, the uh, Affordable Housing Coalition, an owner of a mobile home park, uh, someone from Legal Aid, uh, and Zach Walls. And uh, Zach was very helpful, talked about, um, as Rockney mentioned, the legislation that uh, he'll be striving for and, and what he thinks um, can happen, which is very positive because it seems as though something needs to be on the state level to help control the interests of, of uh, these folks, residents of mobile homes. So so that was very good. Uh, and as he said, we'll be meeting again later this month. Uh, also uh, on the Juneteenth celebration, um, it, 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 it seemed very, very successful. Uh, people were having a good time. The great displays of the many services that are available in our community, which was very good and some good entertainment. And then the block party. Uh, I think I heard estimate 40 to 42,000 people. So uh, kudos 
goes to the downtown district for another very successful block party. Uh, and the weather even cooperated, didn't start sprinkling until around 10.30 or so. So despite the continued construction downtown, uh, it was very successful. Uh, let's see, over the past week, um, I've had the pleasure of attending three different events uh, that involved uh, visitors through the Center for International Visitors in Iowa City, the Civic Group, uh, the Mandela Fellows. Um, two of the young ladies were in our audience today because they were very curious about our climate action plan and just kind of how our city government worked too. So I was very pleased to, to see them here and they were excited and had a great time. So that was good. It's a very impressive um, group of individuals that have accomplished a lot in, in their home countries. Uh, m many of the different uh, areas of Africa they're from, um, their bio bios are just absolutely amazing. Uh, and what was very pleasing, and Jim heard this from them too, uh, they uh, commented on the green, how green our, our city was. They they were just amazed at that. And uh, one of the events, we were up on the upper level in a penthouse, and, and you looked out over the city, and you, you could really see it. Uh, I think Jim commented, it looked like we were like in the middle of a forest. Uh, there really is a lot of green. You'd be pleased, John. There there, there are tree canopies out there. that uh, but they And they loved that. They said they just don't see that uh, in any of the countries they come from. They also said they had the opportunity to attend the block party, which surprised me. They had free time that night, and, and they absolutely loved that. They had a great time, so so that was good to hear. Um. So uh, they also said what wonderful, how warm and welcoming and wonderful Iowa City is, and, and that uh, uh, really makes me proud uh, to be a member uh, of this city and, and to know. Uh, and they pointed out things that we kind of take for granted, which was, was good, a good thing. Um, let's see. Jim and I will be, oh, that's a meeting, though. Or will that be a meeting? Well, we're going to meet with the representatives from the school district um, uh, this week, Wednesday, just to kind of update on what they're up to. Um, um, remind folks about Jazz Fest this weekend coming up. Lots of activities, lots of fun. That's all. All right. Susan? Nothing else that hasn't already been covered. John? Uh, I have the pleasure of attending um, a few days ago the Inclusive Teaching Awards along with Jim at the library. This is a, a event or a program where teachers in Iowa City are recognized by their own students for their inclusionary, mm -hmm. inclusive behavior in the classroom uh, and given recognition at, these, at this event, which I'm, I'm guessing is held annually. Uh, and it was a wonderful event. This yeah. was the first time. This was the first one? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Is it planned? It must be something, I hope. I hope so. And the speaker I, was. I highly, I think it's a wonderful reflection of Iowa City. And um, the guest speaker was the daughter of Reverend Oliver Brown, who was the Brown of Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. So that was a very kind of interesting angle on this notion of inclusion in education, of course. You know, the breaking down of uh, segregation in the schools. So yeah, it was, it was a very touching experience. And, and one of the award winners said, um, teachers need a little bit of love, too. <laughs> So that was sort of a, uh, it was just a very, very pleasant event. Yeah, I'll mention a few things. Uh, there are many uh, events that I went to, and you all have already mentioned them, so thanks for doing that. I had an opportunity to attend the State of the Downtown annual meeting in the alley. And John, you were there. Um, I don't think anybody else was there, but Jeff was there. Um, uh, and it was great. Mm -hmm. I have nothing but praise for Nancy Bird and the downtown district people and Thomas Agron for painting the, if you will, the floor of that alley space and all the cleaning up they did. But it really shows how much improvement you can make by using a little creativity, a little paint, some lights, some elbow grease, and a few plants. <laughs> it's a very impressive thing. I, I admire it a lot. I also attended the Sudanese Democratic Revolution Forum over in Coralville on the 27th, and that was pretty enlightening. A little bit of history about Sudan and the dictatorships they've lived under. The, I think they, the speaker said that they've lived like 55 years under dictatorships in the last 66 years. 11 years, you know. Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, so it's pretty instructive. I was really happy to go. 
I, uh, completely different thing. I attended an open house at the, uh, I don't know how you say this, 1,133rd Transportation Com Company Armory on the 29th of June. And I went there because I was invited to go, but uh, it, what it turned out to be was uh, education for potential employers of National Guard members because there are rules you got to follow as an employer, and I didn't know anything about those rules, so, so it's pretty instructive to do. Uh, you already mentioned the, no, you didn't mention it. Uh, w w uh, Susan, you're going to NR, uh, the National Natural Resources Commission meeting? I believe so, yes. And Bruce, are you going, right? And Jeff, no, you're not going. Is Captain Cam you are, and Captain Campbell's going too. Is that it? Just they're the, just the five of us, or is there somebody else going? Sue Dulick from Eleanor's office will be there as well. Okay. Well, we have <laughs> we have a crew going. Good deal. Anyhow, we're going to do that on July the 11th in Boone, Iowa. Uh, the Lucas Farm neighborhood is having its fifth annual History Day on July the 14th, from 1 to 5 p.m. And I've been to that several times. It's really terrific. Julie, uh, Judy Nyron has done a fabulous job with that neighborhood, so bravo. And we have a joint ent entities meeting on July the 15th, so that will be what it will be. <laughs> That's it for me. Jeff? Nothing. We're working on the budget, so uh, tomorrow we will be releasing news news and social media feeds for our survey, our priorities survey that uh, relates to our tip-in budget activity. So uh, just be on the lookout for that uh, this week. Eleanor. Kelly? All right. Given that, I think uh, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, second by Teague. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned.